Okay, I thought I'd give you a little bit of background on evolution just to make it hopefully a bit more achievable as you work your way through style and, and prepare for your uh, your presentation. So, three rather um, significant individuals in the development of the idea of evolution. It wasn't just about Darwin. There's a lot of people who were thinking along the same lines and trying to work out how the hell it worked. And the guy called Jean-Baptiste Lamarck was probably the first really serious scientist to put an idea forward. He lived in France, a strongly Catholic country, so he was a bit constrained at what he could do. But he simply suggested that um, animals would gain a new characteristic and pass it on to their children. So that's how he explained how um, uh, giraffes got longer necks. They were straining to get to the top leaves to avoid competition with other animals. And having strained, they stretch their neck. And so their, their babies have longer necks, and then their babies do the same thing and they get longer necks, and it sort of made sense. Crap, you know, seems simple. Um, Darwin's the guy who suggested that um, it's all actually based on natural selection. So if, you've, if you develop a new trait and it's of great advantage to you, then you'll live and pass it on. If you develop a new trait that causes you to be disadvantaged, then you'll probably die and not get to pass it on. Uh, he was sitting on this idea, not in a hurry to talk about it, because he knew what sort of trouble he'd get into. Um, but he heard about Alfred Wallace, who had come up with the same idea. He was a younger man and had been working on the same idea following Darwin. And uh, so it caused Darwin to rush out and put his uh, his book out and cause a whole lot of grief for him. Um, because it sort of may, means that God's not the creator. So essentially this is about change over time. So it, it's a very slow process that requires the planet to have been around a long time. And it, you know we've been here 4.6 billion years and life's been around you know, almost 4 billion. And it takes that sort of time for evolution to change this to occur and to stay in place. So the modern theory works on the fact that a, <clears throat> a population must reproduce to exist. There are usually an excess of potential offspring. Within that offspring, there are variations. Those variations will produce individuals who are more likely to succeed than others, so more fit for their environment. They get to pass on their traits because they get to get more food and whatever. Um, so over time, we see a change in adaptation to survival in that environment, which allows that particular individual to or that, that, those with that trait to continue, and we see changes in the um, in the populations, and we create a thing called divergence. And so these populations diverge; they become different, move away, and we get new species. It takes a long time. <clears throat> Darwin's finches were uh, one of these um, examples that Darwin had, and since then we've actually discovered it's a little bit more complex than what da Darwin understood. Darwin didn't have genes; he didn't know about genes, so he discovered all these species of finch. And he worked out, in fact, that all of them were related to each other. These islands, and the Galapagos Islands, are volcanic islands off the coast of South America, and they have a whole range of different niches, different places that animals could exist in, get their food from and not compete with each other, which is a, a big advantage. And these had all evolved from an original pair of animals that had been blown there by a storm from the mainland. So this guy really thinking, and uh, he then started seeing these same patterns all over the world. He travelled around on the Beagle, uh, a ship, a uh, royal, um, a ship for the, the Royal Navy, um, <clears throat> and these mutations that allow this to occur, of course, happens via sexual reproduction. So sexual reproduction allows these variations to become much more complex, and you see all these different beak sizes and bird shape sizes and nesting habitats and the use of the environment changes as they take over little different niches on different islands. Um, <clears throat> so this idea of selection sort of suggests that, you know, that there must be variation. So every, every trait, there's a, there are variations. Um, we call these alleles. Some of these are better suited than others, and so they get to survive. Not all individuals will get the chance to survive and reproduce. Those with the best alleles, the best variations will. Um, and those individuals that do survive, therefore get to pass them on, they reproduce and pass them on. And over time, these become embedded in the species and the species becomes different. So, 
what the hell was Darwin thinking? Where did he get these ideas from? When Darwin was writing, another guy called Charles Lyell was doing a whole lot of geological work in England, and he started finding fossils everywhere. And so this is a bit, what the hell, where do these animals and plants come from? Why are they still around? So he started digging up extinct stuff. And then suddenly it became this pattern of, of time. So clearly the Earth had been a lot older than they thought it was. At that point in time, it was 4004 BC was created. Um, so we pushed that back a few billion years. Um, but fossils were one of the re first really big finds to start people asking questions. And fossils um, can be trace fossils, casts, like this one here on the diagram, um, amber, as we saw in that wonderful film, uh, Jurassic Park, and sometimes completely preserved body parts. Um, but the fossilization process is quite a delicate one. So essentially to be fossilized, you need to die and be buried really quickly in a space that remains reasonably undisturbed. You need to exclude oxygen, so a really good layer of dirt on top. The hard parts slowly leach out, so the bones all slowly leach away, and the space that they took up becomes like a mould, and they get filled with um, sediments, and those sediments harden. So when you find a cast fossil, it's not actually the bone, it's a, it's a recreation of the bone. It's occurred over a long period of time. So as you imagine, fossils are pretty rare, really, in the, in the environment. We age fossils in two main ways. Now for Darwin, was, this is sort of the way he would work. The deeper in the ground, the older they are. Sort of makes sense, doesn't it? So these guys will lay down first, then there's some other stuff going on, then I've got a whole lot more fossils in here, then some other stuff happened, then some more fossils in here, and some other stuff, and lots of fossils in here. That was a big time of um, fossilization, of uh, extinction, and some more dirt on top of that. In each of these layers, we look for things called, um, oh, now the word's gone. So a signature fossil, a fossil that's found in that same layer all over the place, and we've aged them, so you get a you can tell straight away how old a layer is because that fossil's there. So it's a good, pretty good way of doing it in the field. Or you can take samples. And in the samples, you can use two different radioactive techniques. Carbon-14. So carbon has a half-life of 5,030 years. 5,730 years. And it decays from carbon-14 to nitrogen. So you can date things for about 40,000 years pretty accurately. Potassium decays to argon, and then so half of your, if you've got a gram of potassium, half of it will become argon in 1.2 billion years. So you can date much older stuff with that. Uh, and you do this with, you know, big fancy machines that measure all the different amounts of these uh, elements. Clearly, the Earth has to be old for this to work. And plate tectonics is a interesting area again of science that shows us how this is always on the move and in fact starts to link into the fact that the planet's pretty old. So we sit here in the middle of the Indo-Australian plate. This is the Pacific Ring of Fire. It's lots of volcanoes and earthquakes occur around here because of course these plates are moving apart all the time, moving against each other, moving away from each other. And you find the activity around the plate margins. By sitting in the middle like we do, we get very little um, volcanic activity. Not free of it, but very rare, and obviously earthquakes are pretty rare. Um, I'll jump on. So, <clears throat> you get this idea here of gone wine and splitting up. I'm going to head out of the way. So, you have um, the original gone wine and landmass is all the southern continents. Here we are Africa and Asia, uh, South America and Australia and you know, all these islands and things, Papua New Guinea and um, Madagascar, that sort of stuff, and they all break off and leave Antarctica on its own. So this is this idea of plates moving apart from these guys living together. That takes a long time, it's a very slow process. But we also find these things occurring on all these continents. So if you look at the fossils of Antarctica below the ice, you find waratahs, you find galaxids, you find this Nothofagus um, beach. We also find these plants in um, South America and Africa, and all the flightless birds exist only in the Southern Hemisphere. They're gone one and birds. They weren't found in the Northern Hemisphere on Laurasia. This is that 
evidence. It's got, got people thinking. And then we started finding, as we started to look at anatomy and physiology, we started to find some other really interesting features. The human, this is color coded deliberately. These are uh, finger phalanges, these brown ones. There's a human hand, there's a cat, there's the whale's flipper, and there's a bat's wing, and these are the same bones. Here's the four forearm bones, still there, and the upper arm bones. So these arms are all about locomotion, and these are closely related species. They're all mammals, and they're all um, have diverged from each other. So there's a bit of evidence of these guys evolving away from each other, but sharing some common um, start starting points. Whereas in this case, we're looking here at a moth, a pterodactyl, bird, and a bat again. And these, have all guys, these guys have all made the same feature. They've evolved a wing for flight, but they don't share those common ancestors. We call these now like structures. Comparative anatomy, uh, embryology became a really big thing for a little while because all of a sudden people realize that, wow, there's not a lot of difference. So if you look here, fish, amphibian, turtle, pig, human, they're all very similar. There's their gills, there's their tail. Because life starts in the water, these features are still found in those embryos in the first trimester. In that second trimester, clearly the fish and amphibian are still looking very similar. The turtle, the reptile, reptile and these two mammals, this one's starting to grow a shell, so it's starting to look a little bit different, but they're still reasonably close together. And of course, by that final trimester, the fish is clearly a fish, that salamander, whatever it is, axolotl. It's clearly um, an amphibian, a nice shell there on the back of the, the turtle, and the pig and the human, yeah, okay, pretty closely related. Right? That's why we use pig uh, blood and pig products in uh, in medicine. Oops, that was it. Nothing. That's better. Um, and we also have these things called vesticle structures. So in a whale, you find the hip and the upper bones, the thigh bones. But there are no legs. There are no real legs. These are floating. They have no function whatsoever. So it's a structure from its evolutionary past. Whales are mammals that went back to the water. So mammals evolved on the, on the land. So these are basically a cow-like structure. They've gone back into the water for whatever reason. And so you still have some evidence of that connection in the hand, inside the flipper, and in here, in these no longer useful structures. And then of course, we've got pretty smart. We start working with the biochemistry. So with the biochemistry, you're finding you know, the same amino acids in different species. Um, you can see these nucleotide sequences are the same for different species or show evolutionary pathways. <clears throat> Um, I'm going to have to rush because I'm running out of time. I'm taking too long. Humans, well, we're primates. We belong to this group of animals. Um, so we all share the grasping hand, that ability to cross our thumb, bicuspid teeth, short nose, really well-developed eyes, and the brain capacity. So you guys are all pretty smart. This is a lovely, slow loris. It's a beautiful animal. Anyway, um, we're hominids, so we belong to this group. The gorilla, chimpanzees, and bonobos. So look being pretty much the same, and the orangutan. We don't have a tail, we have a much larger body size, much more complex cerebral cortex, um, the characteristic upper jaw, we all share that jaw, and our frontal bone features are very similar. And of course, oh, and the molecular evidence for that is found in the mitochondrial DNA, showing us how we've diverged from each other. So the apes, the um, gorillas diverged first, the orangutans, no, the orangutans diverged first, then the apes diverged then the um, chimpanzees and bonobos diverged. And so we're all like closely related cousins. So what's it mean to be human? Well, we walk fully upright. We have fewer and smaller teeth. We have a flat face and lack that heavy brow ridge. We have a much larger cranial capacity for our body size. We make tools, we use language and art, we are self-aware. Um, last couple of probably caught in the question by recent research, but we are very different to other animals. And I just made it in time before this video finishes. Perfect.